Good evening, everyone. My name is Devin McPherson. I will be your Sergeant Arms and your webinar coordinator for this particular webinar. Tonight, our webinar will be in ESL. Our presenter is an active DTM and has been for nine years. As you can see, she's been very involved both at the area and club level and has trained over 400 people both in Toastmasters and in other corporations and is a, mem a mentor for numerous members of our club. Tonight, I present to you Eva Zeals. Eva, I will now make you a presenter and go for it. Thank you, Devon, for a great introduction. I, please let me know if you've got hard time hearing me. We have uh, prepared for you a uh, program which is really loaded with information. We have to move through the presentation rather fast. So hold on tight. Right will be wild. And now uh, we are starting, hopefully, in a um, uh, fun mode. And uh, we will be playing a video. Let me know if any of you actually have seen this uh, video before. I must admit I've seen it now over 30 times and still I find it funny. I'm just going to go back into my uh, presentation mode. And um, Devon hopefully will be able to help us to get back into the right slide. So tonight we will talk about first about the objectives, then about six English uh, speech principles. Thank you, Devon. Ten evaluation tips, six popular misconceptions, ten presentation tips for English as a second language, one example only, a couple of development steps, and hopefully we will have uh, time for a Q&A. People ask me for whose this session is actually designed. Is it for people who have English as a second, third, or fourth language, like in my case? Uh, my first language is Czech, second Slovak, then Russian, and finally English. Or is it for people who actually have English as the own language? And the answer is, it is for everybody. The session was also designed for managers, coaches, and mentors of ESL and anybody who actually interacts with ESL. It seems to be a um, topic that brings a lot of emotions, so that's why I inserted this slide to make sure that we put the emotions to rest. I want to make sure that the ESL speakers don't feel that we are trying to fix them. I have been trying to do that myself and I haven't succeeded much. It's not to make them feel either inadequate or forget about all of the hardship, forget about where they came from, forget about we, about the past months to uh, get uh, to Canada and uh, being established in a new location. The number one objective of this session is to build confidence. And the confidence actually is um, an issue for both sides of um, the um, ESL story. We will build confidence of the evaluators and we will build confidence of the ESL speakers at the same time. The same goes for the adding to already existing skills. ESL has to build more skills to, they have to add more skills to what they already have, but English native speakers have to learn what 
are the key principles that we apply in English that their English actually sounds so wonderful. And they have to be able to explain why the ESL speakers are not doing something correctly, or they are, and how to fix it. At the end, I hope that everybody will have more opportunities in their lives. ESL speakers by being able to communicate more clearly and English native speakers or their evaluators by developing coaching and mentoring skills. So now we cleared the uh, tough part and we can go into why is this session? Have you noticed that in some of the class we have up to 90% of members either English as a second, third or fourth language? ESL speakers, when they join Toastmasters, expect specific feedback for their English. Unfortunately, we have heard through the grade five that ESL speakers leave Toastmasters when they do not receive the specific feedback. So this session is to help to engage and retain members and also to help the ESL speakers to develop the skills faster. Because sooner or later, we will develop the skills anyway, but this is to help them to speed through their development. Even though my um, English doesn't sound as perfect as I was hoping for, I've been teaching this session now for four years. And I've been working on the content with two experts. One is Nadia Pelton. Um, her title is actually rather scary. She's certified speech language pathologist. And I want to make sure that the um, pathologist doesn't scare people. And therefore, I remove it from the slide in the first place. The uh, speech therapy is not well known English enhancement approach and um, just because they have language pathologists in their name doesn't mean that they cut out your tongue in pieces. I wish it was that easy. We have more information about speech therapy at the end of the presentation. You can always use it as a reference. One area that the speech ther therapist focus on is actually specifically adults and they work on what is called accent reduction. Accent reduction actually equals improving English pronunciation. And I've been also working with uh, Kelly Schurer, who is a communication expert. I want to make sure that we all refer to um, the same topic. Uh, I know that some different terms that are used for English as a second language is English as a foreign language, additional language. For the purpose of this session, we will be talking about the Canadian or the local dialect. Because the people who have English as a first language, but it's a non-local dialect, such as British or Nigerian or Irish, face some of the similar difficulties as ESL. They have different pronunciation, they use different grammar and different vocabulary. So how do you know that you are ESL? Well, you can see you've got a few points to make. People ask you where you were born. And if you are like me, you could ask thousands of times. Your audience focuses more on how you speak versus what you are saying. And unfortunately, we can't um, see the different faces. So I can't demonstrate in the webinar. But uh, over time, ESL typically becomes very sensitive to those clues that people have no idea what they're talking about. People ask frequently, uh, so we repeat our message. Unfortunately, these um, aspects um, undermine our confidence. So at times, ESL speakers actually withdraw their voice, and now people can't actually hear them, whereas the ESL speakers think that they don't understand them. Typically, our confidence is decreased over time, so people who were the leaders in their field, in their country of origin, are now um, lacking in confidence and are wondering uh, what is actually being understood or not. And we make embarrassing uh, pronunciation errors. Sometimes they are not embarrassing, sometimes they are only funny. 
So I hope for ESL can be also a very good entertaining aspect. And we will get right into the few words that ESL shouldn't be using. The first two have different problems than the rest of them. The first two are actually abbreviations of the long proper words, which we use in the spoken language. And the difference between can and can't is so small that it's difficult for people to pronounce it correctly. So the way to go around it is to use the long cannot. The problem is will and want, will not, and I want something that is again very similar pronunciation. So to go around it, just use the long word. The rest of them I'm not going to practice. Because I could get into the um, unpolite versions of the words, the only one that I actually practice at times from, um, just for a form of entertainment is the last word. And I just shorten the sheet at the end and uh, pretend that I don't know much about English because we use spreadsheets at work all the time. So be aware of those words. We will now get right into the six English speech principles. Oh, by the way, for all of you who wonder why you are looking at uh, the small picture of me at, on every single slide, it's not because I'm an egomaniac. I was hoping that you can pretend that you put at least some kind of eye contact and you are not just uh, looking at the slides. So we will go over six English speech principles. Be safe. I didn't come up with them because you can hear that I'm not using all of them perfectly yet. They were based uh, on the uh, speech uh, therapy principles. And um, we need to use them when we provide feedback. Don't worry, you are not going to listen to my voice. We will be listening to Nadia's recordings. We have to play a little bit with the technology. So if you hear silence or other noises that you were not, um, or noises that you were not expecting, we are just trying to figure out with Lisa how to get things going. And this is how the whole thing will go. We will listen to the recording once. And then we will, well, you will practice out loud. Do not worry. You are all muted. None of us is going to hear your practice. I want to keep in mind that you are aware that in English, we have 26 letters. 26 letters in the alphabet. The question is, how many sounds do we have in English? The logical answer is the same number as the sound, 26. No, 46. Yes, we have 46 sounds, which is almost double, because different combinations of letters then create different sounds. And on the top of everything, we have 14 different vowels in English. Czech is my first language, and that language has only five. Uh, 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 ooh. English has 14. I want you to practice and put all of the energy into your practice. Don't hold back. We are not going to hear you. The only one who is going to hear you is maybe your cat or mother-in-law, and who cares? And the reason why I want you to really get into it is because when you put all of the energy into the practice, you will actually get what are some of the challenges for the ESL speakers? Because the English native speakers, when they just practice it just like if they would speak every day, they wouldn't get the challenge. I will now move into opening the slides and we will listen to the first recording. So, Steve, please speak slowly. Ah, my assistant was a little bit too fast. So, the first speech principle. It's about stretching and shaping each vowel. One thing that I would like to tell you is that in other languages, vowels sound for maybe a half or one second. In English, they stretch as far as two to three seconds. There are two techniques how to stretch the English vowel. One is dropping the jaw. It's what the singers do. You drop the jaw and you are able to stretch the sound. And the second one is use the tongue. So I will now play for second time 
the recording and I am encouraging you to go out and practice this recording. Steve, please speak slowly. Thank you. And we can go now back to the presentation. The second speech principle is to use, to pronounce all of the word endings. This, to be able to pronounce all of the word endings, we need two things. One, speak slowly. English language requires a lot of air. When ESL speakers start to speak fast, well, any speaking, they actually don't have enough air and therefore they cut out the word ending. The second part is to breathe more deeply. Again, breathing more deeply allows us to get more air and then we can pronounce the word ending. So we will first listen to the recording and then we will practice. I explained it was packaged and mailed yesterday. Oh, by the way, I'm not preventing you from practicing on the first play anyway. So if you start, please. Mm -hmm. I explained it was packaged and mailed yesterday. What a shame. I can't hear you, your beautiful practice. The third speech principle is linking words together. Choppy English is very hard to understand. It feels really jerky. It's like stop and go, stop and go. I don't know if any of you like skiing, skiing like me. It's like the spring skiing when the snow is funny and kind of go and stop and go. We need to be able to link the words. And when we link the words, we have improved intonation. Keep in mind, English is like a swing music, not like a rap music. So we will listen to our language. I think I can erase it. Thank you. I think I can erase it. Okay, hopefully everybody was practicing. This is so hard that I can't check in everybody. The fourth principle is to change the stress, this change, to change the meaning. For some people, oh, we are going too far. For some people, this is a very easy principle, like for me, I've got no problem. But a lot of um, people are struggling to put the right stress on the right, um, on the right word. This recording is a little bit longer. So what we will do, we will play the whole recording and you have to listen to all of those sentences and then you practice again. The chocolate cake was delicious. The chocolate cake was delicious. The chocolate cake was delicious. I hope that you are having fun with this one. The chocolate cake was delicious. The chocolate cake was delicious. The chocolate cake was delicious. At this point, typically people ask me for either chocolate muffin or chocolate cake. We are unable to provide it via the webinar. We will be serving those during the next education session in person. We can go to the next slide. The fifth principle is to pause after every thought. One problem that uh, we face in Toastmasters is that people who lack, well, People sometimes learn how to go this voice up instead of voice down. When we pause after every thought, it forces us to go more with the voice down. He won the West Coast Championship last winter. He won the West Coast Championship last winter. And the last principle. Not the last recording, second last recording, the last principle is to project your voice forward. I want to mention here what happens when ESL speakers, and actually any speakers, you probably notice that yourself, um, lose confidence. They speak fast, which unfortunately damages their pronunciation because as we know, English requires a lot of air. When we speak fast, we 
stop breathing deeply, we don't have enough air. We literally eat the word uh, endings. And the second thing that speakers do, they withdraw their voice. So now they start to whisper and we can't hear them. So by them being not by ESL speakers having confidence, it already improves their ability. How many times must I tell you? How many times must I tell you? And we are moving along to the evaluation tip number one. So how do we approach the evaluation? One way is to set the intention that the evaluation is going to be successful. Just set the intention. And how do we know that we were actually successful? The success indicators are very similar for both the evaluators and the speakers. Keep in mind why we actually do evaluation. The primary goal is to increase the confidence and the competence. We are not here to punish the speakers for imperfection. Leave it up to the ESL speakers. We are very good at it. What, what we want to make sure is that we point at what is what they are good at. We recognize the efforts that they put into the presentation. And then we provide them specific ideas for improvement. When we are successful with evaluations, this is what happens. When you are a good evaluator, the speaker comes to you and says, Oh, thank you. That was a really nice presentation. It is nice evaluation. I like your tip. When the evaluation was also successful, the speaker has more confidence. Oh, I know what I'm doing well. We receive positive feedback. The speakers typically feel better themselves and they receive positive feedback from others. Very clear indicator is that the evaluators carry on with the evaluation, even though it doesn't mean that it's easy, and the speakers do not drop from the Toastmaster program. We know when we are not providing a good evaluation when the speakers sleep, when our members sleep. And hopefully, everybody should improve over time. It should get, we should be more confident providing evaluation, although I must say that after all those years, I'm still extremely diligent doing every single evaluation. The second tip is to set the right approach. So I suggest the three-step approach. Number one is being kind. Now, we think that we should be kind because that's how we were taught to be Canadian. No, there's a very good technical reason why you want to be kind. We are all humans. When we are not too kind to each other, and there is real or perceived danger, our basic design kicks in, and we get immediately into the fight and flight. What happens to our body? All of the blood that was in the brain gets into the muscles. We have no IQ left, literally. We are ready to either hit somebody or run away. For that, we don't need much brain. When we are unkind during our evaluation, we lose the receiver. The receiver feels threatened, the speaker feels threatened, and they are not listening. So whatever we say right now afterwards really doesn't count, regardless how good suggestions they were. So everybody must feel comfortable first. When you are not comfortable as the evaluator, the speaker picks on it right away. We are like kids. We just copy the energy. The number two step is being specific. And I'm going to tell you how specific we have to be. If you think about it when you are at work and you, provi you are providing feedback to somebody about the presentation. And if you want to be really helpful, this is how you would probably go around the feedback. You say, on the fifth slide, the third bullet, the second word, and that's how specific you have to be with the speaker as well. At the beginning of your speech, it was the third 
sixth sentence and the last word and the last word was supposed to be weak. W E E K. And you pronounce it as weak. I need you to pronounce it, I suggest you pronounce it 50% longer and then you will achieve the right result. That's how specific. I hear feedback from evaluators all the time how shocked they are, how the feedback has to be specific. The more specific you are, the less personal you are, the more open the speaker will be to it. And have fun with it. I've seen the other day, well, last year, or last year, the Spring Evaluation Contest at our division level. And there was a contestant who was so light and at ease during the evaluation that it made me feel so good. And I wish that person would evaluate me too. When you make it fun, when everybody feels comfortable, the whole process and the whole outcome is so much stronger. And the speaker, I, I guarantee the speaker will come to you and thank you for your feedback and will ask to have you as the evaluator in the future as well. We will go right into the next uh, evaluation tip and it's about preparation. You probably know this one from before. There should be meeting prior to meeting, reviewing the objectives, which probably everybody is doing, but sometimes during the speech that is um, already going on. And I would ask if people want any specific feedback. Some of the ESL speakers, like many of our club members, already have gone through the speech therapy. They already know which sounds they need to work on. And they might ask you, oh, please, can you watch for my Ws, TH, or a sound? I want to really make sure that I pronounce them correctly. And then tell the speaker in advance how you will structure the, the evaluation. Why? Well, we just talked about it in the previous slide. You want to make sure that they are mentally prepared, they feel safe, and they will listen to what you have to say. Write down the notes. Because we work with people from all over the world, we have to make sure that we wrote the notes so we can read it, but that the speaker can read it as well. Provide it right away. The shorter the delay, the better. Why? Our memory doesn't work that well. So you might not even uh, remember well what you meant by the note. And sometimes I would even go and read the note just to make sure that the speaker understood every part of it as well. Analyzing the speech takes time. Keep in mind, you are looking for strength and you are looking for ideas for improvement for next time. I work as a business analyst, so what drives me crazy when people don't analyze my speech properly and, and give me a vague feedback. So you are looking for what went right or could be improved. Why? If you don't say why, it's going to be very difficult for the speaker to improve. How they can improve. Sometimes there are a couple of different options. And we already talked about it, how specific the example must be. And use a structure that again puts the speaker at ease. What you like about this presentation and why? What would you suggest for improvement next time and why? This is a specific example. And you can use the sandwich method. Make sure that you don't choke your speaker with the sandwich. It's not to overwhelm. It's a nice appetizer, not to um, gain weight afterwards. You encourage the speaker. What are some of the encouraging words? Well, thank them for their presentation. Thank them, congratulate them on delivering another project. It takes guts to deliver a presentation in front of people in your native language. What about in your second, third, or fourth language? I like to use the more of. Because sometimes, well, most of the times the speakers already do what they are supposed to. They just need to do it more often. I like to use even uh, the word even, make it even stronger, make it even longer, make it even better. And I like the last sentence. To understand you even better, I suggest more of. Now you are actually 
removing, um, you are suggesting that are already doing what they are supposed to, and you suggest that you already understand them, that you just want to understand them better. One area that people are not aware of is that everybody, every member of the audience understands something different. Why? It depends on their like language background. It depends to this exposure to the specific first, second language of the ESL speaker. And we all agree on that one. It depends how much attention we pay at the moment. If we are the evaluator and we are writing down some notes, during writing we might not be as attentive as during the active listening. I want to give you an example. Think about it. Let's say that the um, ESL speaker has first language Russian. So who is going to understand the speaker the most? Somebody who's got Russian as a first language as well. Or somebody who's got Slavic language as their first language. Why? They probably know what the sounds were meant to be. They have the translation tables in their head. Why? They make the same mistakes. Or somebody who probably works close to the Slavic language, with people with Slavic, from Slavic, uh, Slavic languages. They are just used to them. But if in the audience is an English native speaker who has never been exposed to ESL or Russian native speaker, they will never be able to catch the same level of the content as the others. And the, I realized this when I was working in international business and we had two board members. One of them had Russian origin, let's call him Ivan, and one of them had English as a first language, let's call him John. John was complaining about Ivan. Hey, I have never any idea what Ivan is talking about. My third language is Russian. I understand Ivan very clearly in his English. Ivan was complaining about John. Although John has had English as a first language, he was mumbling. He didn't speak clearly. He didn't project his voice forward. And Ivan had no idea what he was talking about. So keep in mind how we all understand something different. Number of suggestions. Just getting into the next slide. I have went through um, a process on my own on how many suggestions for improvement should be present. So what is the goal of evaluation? Is to build confidence and competence, not to punish the speaker. My suggestion is to have one to two suggestions, or two, my suggestions, have one to two su suggestions for improvement. If you think that you've got more, see if you can group them and present them as two groups only with multiple examples. Why? If you present more than that, it's very difficult to improve multiple things at once and you are probably going to undermine the confidence of the speaker. This tendency of stating feedback more than once is a very bad habit and it turns eventually into a nagging. So don't apologize. Don't sound like if you don't know what you are talking about or questioning your own delivery. Say the suggestion for improvement once and move on. Sometimes people find it really hard how to get started. To start with a feedback that you probably know in your mind for a while, and this presentation just helps you to validate it. Or start with something that is really frequent, that it's not just for that specific speaker, but it's just a bad habit in your class. In some clubs, a lot of people go with the voice up at the end of the sentence instead of voice down. Or start with something that you realize that it's so difficult for you to understand, you just must say it. Or start with the most open member 
who is so keen. You know who those keenest are in your club. So what are some of the misconceptions in evaluation? I have heard more than those, so I try to um, minimize um, the number of misconceptions. But number one is accent defines who you are. So I was um, trying to go through the speech therapy and people would tell me, but Eva, your accent is who you are. So I hope that I'm much more than my English pronunciation. And I bet that even if I sound like Calgarian, I will still be who I am. In fact, I will be more of who I am because I will get more opportunities in my life. Second one is, it is okay to have a strong accent. Interestingly enough, I have heard this one only from people who have no accent. And what is an accent? Accent is incorrect pronunciation. Accent is actually scientifically measured. When somebody has 100% correct local pronunciation, local dialect pronunciation, that person is considered to have no accent. Somebody who's got 93% plus correct pronunciation, that person is considered to have extremely mild, close to no accent, therefore is extremely clearly understood. Somebody who has 60% correct English pronunciation is very hard to understand. Therefore, we cannot say general term, it's okay to have a strong accent, because strong accent means that the people are not being clearly understood, which is a problem. Another misconception is that ESL speaker cannot provide effective feedback to another ESL speaker. Specifically in our club, we train people to help one another, and I can see how ESL speakers are very effective. The perfect part of it is that when we provide feedback to one ESL speaker, for example, watch for your past tenses, they start watching for past tenses not only on their own, but for the other speakers as well. And they pick on it very quickly. We do not discriminate ESL speaker by providing feedback. In fact, we actually heard them. People don't learn enough about English at work at Toastmasters. We have to have a very comprehensive plan. And we will talk about it quickly as soon. And we are never going to provide a past feedback because even an advanced ESL speaker still has a heart and has the same basic design and he still needs to be uh, feeling safe just like others. The presentation tips were designed for the ESL speaker. One observation that I have made that when people actually have the confidence when they speak with the intention to be understood, they, their English actually improves right away. So set your intentions clearly that you will be understood. Try to figure out what to work on from the feedback that you receive from multiple people. Look for patterns, cut off anything contradicting, and choose whatever you want to work on. The easiest, the most frequent, the biggest impact, Choose what is close to your heart. Select the topic, if you can, that's what we can all the time, but at least those masters, we can topic that you really like and that you really know a lot about. Why? Because you will feel emotionally connected and I will bet that your English will actually be stronger. Write your presentation. You will make fewer grammatical errors. Impromptu speaking causes ESL speakers to more, make more grammatical errors. And practice your speech with English native speakers. When you write your speech, highlight the sounds that you know that are challenging for you to pronounce. When you read your speech, then you can visually focus on those specific sounds. Use everything short. Short words, short phrases, short sentences, short presentations. If the presentation asks for five to seven minutes, practice for the five minutes. Slow down. We already talked about it. When we slow down, we have more air, we have more clear articulation. Slowing down means that we will also pronounce more correctly. Our speech rate should be about 150 words per minute, unless you are trying to figure out how to deliver too much content in a short webinar. 
the uh, uh, US President Obama speaks actually at a speech rate of 120 words. Think about it when you heard last time his speech, how clearly he spoke. Use stress. Stress gets the attention of your audience. You can be even louder, or use the high pitch, like the little toddlers that you have at home who drive up crazy, or you stretch your wall. Yeah, that's the tough one for yourself. In terms of grammar, some of the common mistakes are the plural, house houses, past tenses, they drive the crazy, articles, why? Many languages do not have articles. Prepositions, we can get them right, but sometimes we cannot get them right, just not completely, or we miss them. And word order, the difference between statement and question. Voice. There is nothing more boring than having monotone voice. The mumbling that you don't know what the other person is talking about. So do not use those techniques. Bring some life to your speech. Project your voice forward. Watch out your sound. Some people have problem with specific sound based on their language background. The letters that I put in there are actually my favorite. And it's interesting that some speakers face challenges with short, some speakers face challenges with long expression. Last tip. Oh, we have the, um, the example. Okay, I have a very short story. I know that people have had too much time, but I have a very short story about the example. We couldn't find a voice. We have to import it from overseas. This is the voice of my sister. This is what is going to happen. We will play for 48 seconds the recording and then we will go over the suggestions for improvement. What I encourage you to do is to take a pen and paper, hopefully you've got it handy, and write down your own notes and then we will compare them. Do you love winter sport? My mother lives in the mountains on a ski hill. This winter has been very warm. We have hardly any snow. We could welcome more snow to get at last some spring skiing. My daughter used to snowboard, but likely switched to skiing this year. It's nice to have a sport which all family members enjoy. Skiing is not too expensive for us. We have the accommodation for free provided by our mother. I hope that you all enjoyed a lot of winter activities this year in Calgary. Thank you, Ole. That's my beloved sister. Nobody wanted to um, volunteer their voice for the example. Nobody wanted to be associated with not having perfect English. So this is how the evaluation would look like. And keep in mind, I picked only two suggestions. I love my sister. I want to encourage her to carry on with learning English. You could have picked completely two different suggestions. I'm sure that she gave you uh, a lot of inspiration what to um, uh, work on. So I would tell her, thank you for stepping up and providing us with an example. You were the only one. Thank you for your courage. It was very easy to understand. Well, I understood clearly because I have the same language background. And of course, she talked about my favorite topic, skiing. So the two ideas to do even better next time is Stretching your valve more consistently. For example, in the spring skiing, she could have lengthened the E in skiing by 50%. And yes, she went with the voice up only at the last sentence. I'm so glad she did it. That's an easy one to pick on. And all I'm asking her to more consistently go with her voice down at the end of statements. Otherwise, it looks like that she, do, she is either asking a question or she has uh, lack of confidence. And thank you, Oli, for providing us such a great example. Oh, we are missing some steps. Never mind. Okay. So, um, actually, I just um, uh, numbered incorrectly. This should be number one. So, for ESL, we always start to encourage them. What should they do differently? Or how can they get help? So, number one is just like the Olympians, get a team of professionals to help you. Those include mentors, English buddies, teachers, coaches, speech therapists. It takes a village to learn to teach ESL speaker to master the English language. Keep in mind, not every English native speaker is a therapist, has a degree in English or communication. They just don't know what they are doing. 
plan in advance, time and budget needed for your improvement, and always um, consider your um, English um, development as part of your uh, professional development. Here are some of the suggestions what you should include for your um, English um, development plan. And I'm not going to go, go over it in detail. I know that many people feel that there is always the one thing to focus on. It's not one. It's all of them. However, you cannot work all of them at the same time. So pick them in the right sequence. Maybe you can work on two, one, two at the same time. And make sure that you always start with an assessment first. Set realistic goals. Don't be like me. When I arrived to England almost 20 years ago, I thought that I was going to sound like a perfect British person within two months, and it never happened. Use your support team. Measure your progress. And I just realized that the uh, slide I got um, um, deleted was actually on the um, assessment. There are many different types of assessments that we can use, such as the speech therapy, the uh, TOEFL, the uh, test of English as a foreign language, uh, Cambridge examination, uh, the Canadian language benchmark, and we have all of those outlined at the end of the presentation. And in summary, so we will have some time for questions, is to keep in mind the principles, tips, the misconceptions, don't play into them, some of the presentation tips, and how to actually improve your English. And it takes a village to teach ESL um, uh, speaker to master the English language. And now we can go into Q&A. Thank you, Eva. If anyone has a question, sorry, that's my fault. If anybody has a question, please place it into the chat window. We'll go from there. So the question is, if the PowerPoint will be posted later, yes. And at the end of the PowerPoint is the um, pronunciation scorecard, which is exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, we can uh, go over the slide. Which is exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, my contact, yeah. You can call me. Uh, regarding the level of accent, uh, the goal is to have 93 plus percentile. You can see whenever you go much uh, lower, it is very difficult to understand. Here's a free evaluation. You just read those um, words and sounds. You have an English native speaker close by. You mark what you uh, scored correctly, and uh, you, go, uh, you get a very quick um, um, idea of how you are doing. The next slide is the Canadian language benchmark. We, I provided the link to um, the site. There are the can do checklists. You can again use this as a free assessment tool. There are 12 levels. A recommendation is to use to achieve eight or higher. I was told that actually 10 or higher is even better. And they look at the four areas of speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And the um, next slide actually shows some of the examples of what people are supposed to be able to do at each of the levels. And uh, here's a little bit of information about the speech therapy, focusing on improving pronunciation, which is one of the um, uh, areas. So uh, the speech therapists have degrees. I think it takes five to seven years to achieve that. They are all registered, and most of the health Plans, health benefits actually cover the speech therapy up to $500 a year. Most of the uh, employees are even not aware of it, so all of the cost doesn't go, doesn't have to go from your pocket. And uh, some of the components of speech therapy is the speaking, listening, articulation, and, and other plans. I just wanted you to know 
what uh, the slides were at the end. So, um, you know, what uh, are your reference? I would like to find out what are some of the challenges for uh, from the evaluators or ESL speakers based on the quick survey we have um, on the line people who about 50% English native speakers and 50% uh, ESL speakers <laughs> so the question is, do you invite native speakers to webinar because some of them are afraid of to touch the pronunciation of grammar right, on their evaluation? Yes. I I was the, the reason why I actually started when I developed the curriculum was because nine years ago I joined Toastmasters and my objective was very clear to improve my English, my presentation skills and my English. Because ESL speakers have to be so much stronger presenters to compensate for their English abilities. And I was shocked that people didn't give me any specific feedback. And then I realized that they are not speech therapists and they don't know what they are doing. And we have to tell them the speech principles because they practice them but they, they don't know what they actually are. And I'm surprised how quickly people are able to incorporate it into their evaluation. And keep in mind, we have now evaluation content. I hope that every single person who is on the phone is participating in evaluation contests. And now you've got a little bit more meat for your content. Ah, so another question. A member who is saying ah at the end of each um each word. Yes. So um I think that it starts with awareness. Many times we just don't even know what we are doing. And each or each language the first language then impacts English differently. We all know the Spanish speakers, they add the uh Found at the beginning of words which start with F. So it's actually interesting. In our club, one Spanish speaker provides feedback to the other Spanish speaker, and it sounds so um, supportive and kind because they can easily relate why they do that, but they ever so kindly make them aware, you know, we are still making those extra sounds and watch it. Those were the words, and uh, they can support one another too. I would also encourage the ESL speakers to ask for the feedback and guide the evaluators or people in their workplace how to provide them with feedback. So another question is about contract available to offer ESL Toastmasters so they could have mutual understanding. Ah, I really like that. Well, in our club, we have the mentorship contract. It can be part of the mentorship contract. I don't know if um, I would go as far as contract with every single ESL speaker. I would just develop slowly the culture. And all it takes is to find one key ESL speaker, ESL member in your club, and say, hey, I took this wonderful ESL evaluation session. Would you be interested in some feedback next time when I'm your evaluator? And I bet that the person would jump and say, yeah, it's wonderful. Tell me what you learn. And uh, sometimes we just have to encourage our evaluators to not to be afraid because it's a new area to step into. Do you have any, I just would like, we have still a couple more minutes. 
And I just would like to find out if you actually are providing feedback to your ESL speakers even now, and what are some of your biggest challenges? Because I hope I face all of them by now, so I should be able to um, give you some input. I will just I don't have to listen just to my own voice today. I would love to hear somebody else's as well. You can unmute yourself and ask a question. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. Oh, idioms. Yes, idioms are giving us a headache or a lot of entertainment. And um, I sometimes still don't get them right and make my friends uh, laugh and control it. Um, oh, hold on. Our, our chatting is, screen is flying. Fellow of my numerous workers may feel uncomfortable giving feedback. That's where professional ESL classes, for example, aha, uh -huh. well, you are right, but Aha, yes, I am facing that too. So there are speakers who we have no idea what they are talking about at all. So, when I face that, I think about it. What is it that the speaker is doing that prevents me from understanding? And I think about it in those terms. Is it a short word? Is it a long word? Is it a sentence structure? Is it a pronunciation? Is it that I'm speaking too fast? Is it that I can't hear them? And when I start asking those questions, which is really going over the principle, typically I can figure it out. And instead of going over, instead of telling them, well, I have no idea what you are talking about, I just it. My suggestion is that you speak more slowly and therefore you have more air to pronounce each word and I will be able to understand you better. Sometimes the feedback is very tricky. I had a speaker who didn't speak fast and still was close to impossible to understand. It was because he was using pauses after each word but pronounced each word extremely fast. So the word was very quick and difficult to get because of the, of the vowels and the pronunciation, but overall the speech rate was actually just fine. Yes. Um, another question is that many English speakers are nervous or afraid of offending and hurting. We understand, but pick, oh, pick, find somebody who is very keen. That is the person. And I feel that we are afraid on both sides, and that's why we are not talking about it. Once we actually are open to the idea of providing feedback to ESL speakers, you will find out that the ESL speakers are hurting by you not providing the feedback instead of you providing the feedback. I had an experience when I provided feedback to an instructor in the workplace who had ESL was English as a second language and the person was almost crying on my shoulder afterwards thanking me because the person had absolutely no idea what sort of impact they had on their audience. So don't think that you are hurting them by telling them. You might be actually saving their lives. I think that we are almost at the end. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending an hour with me, although I couldn't see any of you. I hope it was helpful. Go ahead, Evan. Sorry, Eva. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Eva, for having spent the hour with us, and thank you to all our attendees for having the time to make the time to be with us. This shall be recorded and put up on the website. And I'd like to thank Eva for all the effort you've put forth into making this webinar so spectacular. 
We have other webinars coming up soon, one with Bev LeBlanc about boot camps, and we will possibly be doing this particular webinar again in the coming months. Please, please, please share your experience, especially if it's been positive, with your clubs and with other Toastmasters. And with that, I will close the webinar and thank you all for coming. Eva, can you please stay online for a moment?